The major geopolitical issue facing Japan and the United States is the issue of Okinawa. Okinawa has long been a base of U.S. operations, particularly during the Vietnam War, and it has also been something of a substitute of stationing troops elsewhere in Japan because the concentration in Okinawa is so heavy. Recently, Okinawa has been in the news because the governor has opposed the central government's promise to the United States to move troops. Initially, the plan was let's move them away from the city and maybe over to Guam or some other place, let's reduce the burden on Okinawa. That has shifted and they were going to move a lot of the troops, particularly helicopter landing and takeoff, from Ginoan City, where Futima is located and it occupies practically the center of the city, move that out and redevelop that property. The governor has opposed that, putting a stalemate into the operation. The central government has now sued the governor, and this is really tumbling out of control. It's really exploding as we talk. It's become really, really tense, not only in terms of the already normally tense relationship that Okinawa has with the Hondo, the main islands, but in terms of just the concept of local control versus central government control. In Japan so far, we've, we've seen actually a fairly liberal and easygoing view from the central government towards the prefectures. But the, in this instance, because of the geopolitical pressures being involved, the, the central government is coming down with a hammer on the governor of Okinawa. And his point is, is you know, rather simple. We, we are a very small part of Japan. We're very far from the rest of Japan, and yet we bear the burden right. of the security treaty. Mm -hmm. uh, the security treaty is supposed to be with all of Japan, so why doesn't the rest of Japan have the bases on them? Mm -hmm. Why is it us? And you cannot put more, you cannot build a new base here. If you want to build a new base, fine, but don't put it here. Well, one of the arguments that the Okinawans have is that we are the poorest, we are the most unemployed prefecture of all the prefectures. Why do we have to bear this this weight of the hosting the U.S. military when we could be developing beaches and resorts and having Okinawa as something of a, of a destination. Right now, flying to Okinawa is more expensive than flying to Guam or maybe even uh, Hawaii. The development of tourism has been retarded is what they've said. All, all the kinds of you know, industries that they could be having they feel that the bases have impinged upon that. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that's true or not is hard to say, and there's always a contingent within Okinawa who say, if we didn't have the bases and the jobs that they provide, we would be in a real, a real economic bind. Right. And the, but the security issue has come into play not only in terms of the United States forces there, but the SDF. Mm -hmm. We had the reports this week that the government has finally decided put 500 SDF on Ishigakijima, which is basically- The farthest island in the chain. Well, it's, it's the one that is certainly the closest to the Senkakus. And in fact, the Senkaku Islands are administratively part of Ishigaki City. And that, for some people saying, aha, Japan is becoming more militaristic. Well, the whole system of protection of those islands has been dependent up until now upon the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty that the United States will defend Japan's, the territories that Japan administers. Mm -hmm. This is not so much maybe as the, the uh, uh, militarism as Japan taking responsibility for its own islands. Well, some would say that. I don't know, Nancy. You've been following this issue and the branding of Japan as a kind of a military power, as somebody that's really beginning to... And she's just been to Okinawa. Well, you were just there. Did you notice the, the massive presence of the United States there, or were you there just too shortly to kind of really absorb how, how, how massive that presence is? I've been there twice. I was invited in 2010 to give talks at all the American centers okay. associated with the U.S. Embassy. My first talk was in Okinawa, which a lot of U.S. speakers don't visit because it has the military umbrella to it. Mm -hmm. So my briefing was a, about Obama's new public diplomacy and foreign policy, but it was to military public affairs and military reporters. And it, it takes on a whole different dimension when you're there. I found the place to be extraordinarily beautiful, but also with a very strong military presence, which you feel when you land. Sure. Now I've been back a couple of weeks ago. I was there for a 
Cyber 3 conference, co-sponsored by the World Economic Forum, on cybersecurity, cyber connection. And as a side trip, I went to a place I'd never heard of called Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University, otherwise known as OIST. Mm -hmm. When you talk about security, you have to think of it outside of just bombs and bullets. And I see a place like OIST as having potential to change how we define security. It is truly international. It has been infused with a billion dollar uh, grant from the Japanese government. So it's a Japanese That's university, but it is taught entirely in English. And they are cherry picking the best minds in science and technology from around the world. All of the doctoral students and postdocs who arrive are treated as research associates. So it's not just the focus, the subject area, but it's also very interdisciplinary. It's also breaking down those hierarchical walls that we deal with mm -hmm. so often in the academy. And I was just completely dumbstruck by it because I thought, I don't believe people in Japan even know about mm -hmm. OIST. <laughs> yeah, and the, but the, if you put all that effort into it, how can you not use it for public diplomacy purposes? I know, right. that's right. Well, and I offered myself, of course, <laughs> because they don't have any social science professors, but they are starting to, well, they open it up to the community. So it has a lot of different dimensions to it. I write about this in the Japan Times. Mm -hmm. Japan's future is an oyster, <laughs> play on words. Um, but it's all about how the potential there is to uh, raise the confidence and the sense of uh, value that Okinawan people can have. So they are welcome to come to these open fairs and meet the faculty and meet the students. Only one out of five of the students is Japanese. So the recruitment is going extremely well globally, mm -hmm. but they're having difficulty. And they even asked me, they said, what can we do to get more highly qualified Japanese students? And I said, well, for one, there's probably a little bit of intimidation in using English at that level because you're not just using it with your cohorts in the lab, right. but also when they get a lot of visitors coming through. These are research associates who really act as kind of like public relations people on behalf of the university, and they explain science in layperson's terms. Right. So I was able to understand the neuroscience and what they were showing me in the lab because they just made it very palatable. And I was so excited about what they're doing there. And I, I want to give a shout out to the uh, chancellor, who Arima, right. who, Arima, who was the former president of the University of Tokyo, now at Musashi University. He was one of the visionaries. Uh, who said, we can do this, and we're going to make this a truly international university. But what they're doing there is a model for the rest of Japan, right. whether it's in the hard sciences or social sciences. One last thing to add. As you know, I'm affiliated with Kyoto University of Foreign Studies. The president of Cuffs uh, wrote to me after he read the article, and he said, why can't we have this kind of atmosphere right. that they have at OIST? in foreign languages and global affairs. And I said, let's do it. Right. But the thing is, it, it's, it's almost a demonstration of how far away Okinawa is from the main islands. You're right. Because, <laughs> the, it, I mean, I've heard about OIST from various people, mostly having to do with the hard sciences. Mm -hmm. And yet, nobody in Tokyo will ever talk to you about it. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And, but the thing is, Okinawa, she's not the only one with Okinawa. Well, no, I mean, I, I, you grew up there. I grew up in Okinawa, and I, as a graduate student, I was also a graduate student in Japan in a Japanese university, and that's not really such a great, fun experience if you've <laughs> had that same experience anywhere in the United States or mm. probably in, in, you know, in places in Europe as well. You know, graduate school 
in Japan is 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 hard mm -hmm. and it's tough and it's physically tough. But the opportunity to go to Okinawa and and do your graduate studies there, what a what an attractive model that is. Mm. So Okinawa is not all bad news, even though that's what the politics is telling us right now. No, it's not all bad news. There are some real problems there economically. Um, a lot of the, it does have the highest population rate. I know there. They, they, they they do enjoy having children. They're yes. the only prefecture which re replaces itself. And you know, the, the level of, of English ability is very high because of the US presence for so long there. And Richard Nixon returned the islands back to Japanese administrative control in, in 1972. 72, 72, yeah. So a, a lot has changed, but it's, you, you can see when you visit there, it's the growth has been somewhat artificially retarded for a lot of different reasons. And I think one of those is, for example, Fatema is sitting right there in the middle of Ginuan City. And it, it looks like a, a huge sore with the rest of the, the city just bustling and growing around it. So the, the fact of moving that huge operation, and a lot of the land is not needed, but it's there, it's all fenced in. Moving that from there to Henako or some other place throughout the, the islands and maybe even uh, to the, the main island here, um, has a certain appeal to it. And, and in contrast to what is an eyesore, Oist is stunningly beautiful, and you can live right there near the campus. You, you, you it's just—it's jaw dropping. Of course, it's right on the water, so it's an easy sell once people get there. Mm -hmm. The way that they framed Okinawa was very interesting. Very far from mainland Japan, so a lot of my Japanese friends haven't even been to Okinawa, mm -hmm. and yet when you're at Oist, they showed me a chart showing people able to fly all over Asia and get to Europe easily. So they were really presenting it as kind of the core, the heart of Asia and easily able to get around the world from there. So they're they're trying to rebrand Okinawa vis-a-vis -vis Oist. Right. And I'm just trying to get the word out, let people know, go and see for, with your own eyes. Don't just believe me, because when I wrote this, I felt like I was writing mm -hmm. a press release. It was so positive, but that's the way I felt. I couldn't find anything that they were doing wrong. They are constantly trying to improve, too. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful learning atmosphere. Right. Can we get back to the governor? The governor is in hot water now, and I think the governor is also somewhat like the discussion we're having right now. He's trying to propel Okinawa. He's trying to rebrand it. He wants it to be more of a center for uh, recreation, for education, for other things other than a, a host for the military. And uh, it looks like the central government has sued him. And this this suit that they've, um, they've filed, uh, probably they're going to win. The, the argument is that the central government allows governors to administer certain prefectures, and they can also disallow that with the uh, insertion of an administrator if the governor doesn't uh, satisfy certain requirements of the central government. We'll be seeing over the, over the winter what happens, because ostensibly, actually, national legislation has to be brought out that forces the governor to bend in this issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, he has gone from strength to strength politically in Okinawa. He appeals to the future Okinawa, not the past Okinawa. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll see how it goes, whether this government, which has shown itself to be extremely tough yes. on domestic issues, whether they will go all the way and force it upon these protesters that we have outside the gates, upon the governor, who will be basically, even though he's popularly elected, which the which Mr. Abe, the prime minister, cannot say, right. no, you know that he was chosen by his colleagues, but Onaga was chosen by the people. Mm -hmm. That they're going to undercut the message of democracy. There, it's they're big, they're really high stakes in this battle, and it doesn't look good. That's an interesting point. But regardless of what the governor says. The central government has already completed drilling holes for the pilings. It is dumping sand and gravel into the bay where the Henneco base is going to be built. The issues between the central government and the current governor are really going to be boiling up. We will see how this develops. Please stay tuned. We'll continue to report on this.